Welcome to a new episode of These Go to Eleven. Let's turn it up. Hey everybody, welcome back to These Go to Eleven, an unchurchy conversation about everyday faith. Please make sure you like, subscribe, and review on your favorite podcast platform. This not only helps us to get our content out there, but also helps us to find out what you, our faithful listeners, think. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to these Go to 11. Once again, I'm Nathan Bell. Joining me as always, Greg Dutcher. Greg, what's going on, man? Dude, January's almost gone. <laughs> What do you mean? What's going on? Joy. You are on cloud nine, my brother. Except for those two amazing days, the birthdays of my daughters. I love you, girls. I love you. I hate January. (laughs) With the burning hatred of a thousand white hot suns. Is that strong (laughs) enough? Uh, No, you know, but we always talk. I get excited this time of year, man. Yeah. Because the days are getting a little bit longer. I mean, we still got a lot of winter to go. Yeah. But this releases when, man? Uh, This releases on oh january, january 31st. 31st yeah look at that it's like we planned it <laughs> we planned it for the last day 28 days folks and then we get into march which is a bland boring month most boring day of the year i don't know why it, to my mind it's always march 12th i'm sorry that's somebody's birthday <laughs> it just if you were to pick a day in the year that is boring it would be march 12th <laughs> it's not a teen it's not a single digit it's not a zero or a five so, uh, but the good thing about March, dude, we've talked about this. When we were planning our podcast schedule the other night, yes. my heart was lifting. Yes. Because we're talking about April, May. We got even a little bit into June. We did. Yeah. We, we started looking ahead and saying, okay, let's uh, let's pick this date to start looking at what we've got uh, throughout the summer. And uh, so, yeah, it's getting exciting. March is actually going to be fun because we're going to take uh, a little bit of a break. We've been hitting um, hard our spiritual topics and looking at doctrine. We have a good friend of mine, Justin Estrada here from Redeemer Presbyterian Church, uh, the one in uh, Kingsville, Maryland, not New York City. <laughs> oh, dude. You... We're rivals, right? Right. <laughs> right. Rivals I, I thought we were going to have <laughs> T- Tim, Tim Ke- Keller. Tim Keller shaking Keller. a little bit right Who's now. Who's this guy? Uh, this is Tim Keller's ugly cousin <laughs> yeah. that, you, that nobody knows about, nobody cares about. That's okay. I love it. Um, but yeah, we're going to take a break. And so we've got, uh, you and I have started already talking. We're going to do a little bit of stuff with entertainment, movies, music. And of course. then um, we are going to dedicate two of those to an uh, AMA for both of us. Yep. So um, you can all start thinking about what you would like to ask Greg or myself, and we'll uh, have those answers for you. So I'd like to mix it up a little, Nathan. Can Instead of doing an AMA, can we do an MMA? And you and I <laughs> get into get the, in the octagon. Cage. And we know. As, I, as honestly, long as you're wearing pants this time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's make that an audio special only. I thought that was when you were going to finally release the video. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that, was, that was the inaugural episode. Justin, that would be the moment. That would be the Subscribers, moment. Subscribers, uh, quadruple, yes. you know, like after the first in, minute. In the octagon, we could call it. Um, you know, Super Nathan versus Potbelly Man. We, we would have... Zod we, Dutcher. Yeah, Zod yeah, Dutcher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I want the Zod of the 70s Superman right, right. Destiny. Yeah, so the one Superman let's live. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Justin, yeah, I like this, man. We got this. That's right. We and, got it. Uh, so, yes, as I mentioned, uh, Justin Estrada from Redeemer Presbyterian Church. Also, Greg, the connection with Redeemer Classical Christian School yes. because you taught there many years ago. Many, many moons ago, yes. And uh, Justin and I still keep still there still together. It's still whispered in it's the hallway. Whispered in the hallway. Dark corners. Yeah. Of- <laughs> sort of. He who must not be named. Yeah. Sort of like how Europeans still reference the bubonic plague. Right. It's a, um, it is a similar thing there. So I view it that the school's had all this time to recover. <laughs> Right, all these years later, we got Justin there doing great stuff. You are there, Nathan. Joy's always yeah. been doing great it's stuff. It's on the bathroom so. wall. Dutch You're, was here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Well, I'm getting man. a good short story idea. I know, so right? I'm going to stick with that. That's good. Um, Justin Estrada. Justin, how are you doing today, man? I'm well. I'm well. Really grateful to, to be with you all. Thank you for this. We're oh, excited yeah, to have you here. We got a, uh, I mean, this was completely unplanned and unscripted, but uh, Greg brought uh, breakfast to us and we were just chilling for about an hour, that just talking and getting to know one another. And so that was a really good time. Uh, Justin, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself um, because, uh, well, first of all, we want to get to know you as a person, friends, family, things like that. And then also um, we're having you on to talk about uh, the creeds, the confessions. And so um, I'm going to, I, and I know that you don't enjoy doing this, but I'm going to have you do it anyway. Talk to us brag a little bit about your background and education because we want to hear all about it and if well, you don't i'll make you brag well remember you know i only get on these podcasts because people think i'm tim keller you yes know, that's you know, right this is how i've got on all my podcasts <laughs> yeah. and i just say redeemer yeah. you know, presbyterian redeemer church Pres- and then suddenly the offers are lining up yes you know? um you know then they take one look and yeah uh, the rejection i'm gonna start doing that with metropolitan tabernacle <laughs> and <laughs> do, do people know spurgeon's dead <laughs> uh, that might not work Anyway, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I would, Justin, I would like tell to us. see you do that. Yeah. You haven't been to Metropolitan Tabernacle. Yeah. I would like to see you walk in, pull just off. as you are. You know, that would be wonderful. You, Justin, yeah. and nobody else on the planet, uh, <laughs> in, including I'm sure the fine people there. Like, who is this slouch? Uh, but yes, we do. Oh, I was very impressed, Nathan, hearing Justin's background, and I know it's always awkward to say, just because to me it represents your passion, your curiosity, mm-hmm. your desire to grow and to learn. Which I always think is a boon to other people, yeah. wherever they are, in terms of what what they're uh, seeking to be and do in life, particularly in uh, their relationship with God. So, yeah, um, yeah. Tell us about ha- start with your friends and family. Yeah, friends well, and yeah. family. No, it's good. I mean, you know, it's probably not the first time it's been said, but I'm yeah, you know, I'm a sinner that by God's grace has been redeemed in Christ, and and He did that from an age that I don't. Um, I'm not aware, right? So God yeah. has been faithful to his covenant promises as as he is. And um, so I grew up in a Christian household. My parents are confessors and yeah. believers. And um, so I grew up in the church, actually grew up in the Presbyterian Church in America, in which I still minister. So that's another sign of God's faithfulness. That yes. Young men and young women are are holding on to that confession yeah. and coming out and living, uh, living in this world as pilgrims in it. So it's a great thing. Um, married to my wife. Laura from mm-hmm. since 2006. Nice. Um, we have the same home church back in Brandon, Florida, Westminster Presbyterian Church there. And um, so we've been married since 2006, have three children, Talis, Eliana, and Mila. So 11, oh. 8, and 7. So very Great blessed. names, yeah, by the way. That's right. Well done. Well, you know, like that was, that was a wonderful opportunity to reflect upon God's grace to us in our lives. So when we named them, we wanted them to be purposeful. So their names were kind of rolling. They each have two middle names to try yeah. to complete some type of uh, some type of expression of our thankfulness. Oh, God. yeah. So, yes, yeah, so that's a good thing. Right? Now, is that part of a Cuban thing, too? Because you've got Cuban heritage. And my brother-in-law actually has Cuban heritage, and his kids have that as well. Is Interesting. That, does that flow with um, that? You know, or? I couldn't I couldn't speak definitively about that. Mm-hmm. I mean, oftentimes in Latin cultures, your, your last names, you have both your mother's and your father's, mm-hmm. right? Uh-huh. So that elongates it a little bit. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, we do, there is like, like most cultures, a tradition where you, you, you name your children after their, you know, their ancestors, yeah. relatives and the mm-hmm. like. So certainly have a family name. Um, Eugene is, mm-hmm. is my middle name. I normally don't say that as, as often. Is that? That's, that's my it? middle name. Get out of here. Well, <laughs> Come on. We are fist bumping that. I know. It, originally, um, it was meant to be the, you know, the Spanish uh, version of it, Eugenio. Oh, yes. But I was born in, in Butte, Montana, yeah. and they took one look at that and said, Eugene will do. You know, like was, <laughs> Eugene will do. So, that is awesome. They weren't even going there. Wait, so. you mean in Butte, Montana, That's they're not going to get <laughs> the precise... I'm not, not making uh, light of anybody in Butte, Montana, but they're not going to get that rich cultural <laughs> heritage coming through the pronunciation. I, I, I think the best part about that is that they didn't even try. Yeah. And they yeah. were unapologetic about <laughs> Eugene. it. Eugene. You know, that's right. Yep. You are Eugene from now on. Yes. So I am. And so is my son. And, and so that carries on in that way. But, I love uh, it. Yeah. But I don't know. So I don't know, you know, yeah. if that's uh if that's a distinctly Cuban, mm-hmm. you know, mentality or tradition. But yeah. but I know it was for us. So nice. Good. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. So we have the, the three kiddos. Um, similar to what you were saying at the beginning, took the call at Redeemer in 2019, but I know you asked to hear a little bit about leading up to that. Yeah. So, um, 
You know, like I actually, I never really planned to go into to ministry or academia. It's not something that came up in our conversation earlier, prior to our um, to beginning. But but I, I played soccer, so my dad was oh, yeah. you know uh, an athlete, you know, professional baseball player, and athletics were very important in our family. And I kind of followed suit, played baseball and soccer, but really kind of you know pushed towards soccer with a lot of blessings that came early on in, in my soccer career. Had opportunities to be a part of the youth national programs. Mm-hmm. Um, for the United States youth national teams and things like that. So I uh, ended up playing soccer. That was really always going to be my trajectory. Um, mm. Clearly had that Christian profession, but in terms of vocation, really thought that, that sports would be my life and played in college, uh, University of Pennsylvania, and you know afterwards had some, some offers and opportunities overseas, had some opportunities to go and play in Holland um, and wow. in Germany. Yeah, so, so some, some that, that's really what I thought I was going to do. But around my end of my junior, senior year, just kind of look, took a look at that trajectory and just knew, you know, from all that time playing what it would, would cost in terms mm-hmm. of time and discipline and, and work. And I just couldn't find it in my heart, you know, to be able to muster that, you know, yeah. to honor to yeah. honor God, yeah. you know, and that um, it, would always, it, w- it was always going to be a struggle. Um, and so at that point, you know, I'm kind of in my senior year um, making that decision, you know, with wisdom and advice from my my parents and then obviously Laura who I'm engaged to at that point Mm -hmm. and kind of coming to the end of of my undergraduate education and thinking well what am I going to do here I'm not going to go play soccer like what does this mean and so you know kind of waffling do I do I go to law school yeah Uh, you know my mom's an attorney Um, oh very cool so do I go to law school Um, do I try some graduate work in academia I I always enjoyed academics I enjoyed philosophy in particular Mm -hmm. do I do that and and none of those really felt felt right, at least mm-hmm. at that moment. And so my dad says, "Why don't you? Uh, wh- why don't you look at seminary? I mean, yeah. clearly you love the Lord. You love the things of the Lord. Um, you know, every time we talk, you're diving deeper into biblical and theological studies. You know, yeah. this, this might at least be the next place to begin. And mm-hmm. you've served in the church as well. You've done ministry. So you know that mm-hmm. generally seminary can be a combination, both vocationally but also academically." So I said, okay, um, and, you know, my dad had always been blessed by R.C. Sproul's ministry at yeah. the Inner Ministries, and, um, and he was at Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando yes. at that time, and my parents they grew up right outside of Tampa uh, in Brandon, so not too far from that. So I go on the website, and I call them up just to get some information, and, and there's no answer. Okay. And so the next one on the list was, was Jackson, Mississippi for Reformed Theological Seminary, yes. and that's the original campus, so I just kind of called up, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, the secretary puts me on with the the dean of students yeah and i kind of start explaining say hey um you know my name is justin i'm at the university of pennsylvania um just looking for some information a little uncertainty with the next steps in my life just wonder if we could kind of talk about that and so the individual's name is brian gall says well, well where do you live now i grew up you know in a little bit more rural area yeah. you know outside of tampa when people even at my home church you know i'd walk in you know from college and they say hey you nittany lion you know yeah. like they, <laughs> they, they they always thought i went to penn state you know right. like, <laughs> because of its football right so yes. i mean and and i didn't correct them because no. i don't know fighting quakers yeah. nittany lions <laughs> you know like i mean, clearly i think we know which one is a little right. is oh, a little oh my better. goodness i love but, it yeah so we um you know so so i'm thinking here's the same thing you know like he's you know the South, big on college football. It's a much more like well-known school and, and for those type of things. And so I'm like, well, I'm in, I'm in Philadelphia here. It goes, oh well, well, well where do you live? I said, well, I, I live on campus, you know, here at, at Penn. He goes, well, where do you live? I'm like, okay, man. Yeah. You know, like I'm in, I'm in this dormitory yeah. on Pine Street. You know, like room number so and so. He goes, oh, I live next door. Oh my and goodness. I, and I said, I said what? And he goes, yeah. And so we began chatting, and Brian had had a. Like actually, a very similar trajectory as my wow. own, and and he said, well, why don't you come and why don't you just just try it out here? You know, like it, uh, we have great student housing. Uh-huh. I didn't have any home at that point. Yeah. Ready to get married to Laura, you know, no place yeah. to live. He's like, I'll give you a job in the admissions office with me, and you can yeah. start working here. Mm-hmm. Um, then you can start summer Greek, and if you want to go toward your masters of divinity, that'd be great, or just stop a little bit earlier with the masters of arts, like that's fine too, and. So that's that's what we did, you know. Wow. The process. So in five weeks, I took my finals. Yeah. Got married to Laura. 
Went on our honeymoon. Wow. Relocated to Jackson, Mississippi. Started that job with Brian in the admissions office and started Summer Greek. You know, so wow. We, we, we were, <laughs> wow. All the things they say, right, the, the major life stressors. Yes. Try to avoid having two of those together at the same time. You right. said... Throw them all in the mixer. <laughs> That's right. It's funny the um, when you know they always do that at Reform, so they have a marriage, uh, marriage and family therapy like center there. Yeah, for counseling. And um, one of the professors, uh, he he takes all the students who are coming in for that year, whether they're doing MDivs, MAs, whatever type of program they're doing, and he does that that stressor test. Yeah. And he says, okay, like all these life changes, like you get you get a score, you know, like yeah. so, like this one's ten points, this one's fifty points, and so if you hit. Like 300, yeah. you've got like a 95% of a nervous breakdown. Oh, my god. So goodness. I walked up to him afterwards, and I, I scored to 600. Oh. I, said, what is, I said, what does this mean? You know? And he looks at it. You know, He's just like, why don't we talk? Oh, <laughs> my <laughs> goodness. You know, so, why do I have so, the next picture of my mind of you, Justin, in a little bed with an IV? <laughs> um, somebody's talking to you in a very soothing voice, handing you a Dixie cup with a pill. It felt that way. Uh, wow. Yeah, that was right. So, wow. And so that is your seminary experience, and you got your MDiv there at, did, I um, did. at RTS. Mm -hmm. And then what came next? So, you know, at that time, like, I, I mean, the Lord confirmed that calling. You know, he was very gracious, um, you know, plugged into different ministries, really latched on to some of the, the subjects that we were studying. And yeah. so, but one thing that I felt like I, I knew that I wanted to participate in, in ministry, in Christian ministry, I didn't know exactly what vocation at that point i knew it i felt called to pastoral ministry but yeah. i didn't know if that would be like full-time pastorate or um or or some other you know variation of that but one thing that i knew is that i certainly wanted to um to get further study i mean it, it's very difficult for any type of divinity program to to do what like like a holistic training in just three years because yeah. there's there's not only academic studies but there's vocational studies um, there's counseling that's done. I mean, there's a lot of different topics and subjects yeah. that you need to go through and that you can only scratch the surface on just by virtue of, of time. And so I knew I wanted deeper study, deeper biblical and theological studies. And, yeah. and I was really blessed, you know, by some faculty members who had come alongside and, and kind of like stoked the love for, for biblical studies, yeah. particularly biblical languages. Um, and so you, at some point, you, I mean, in your, as you go on further graduate studies, you've got to begin to specialize. Um, yeah. And so I felt, well, I, at the very least, I want to start with, with Old Testament mm -hmm. Hebrew studies. So I began looking around, and, um, you know, there, the, the way that I did it is just certain people that I wanted to study with, and there happened to be a gentleman at, at Oxford. He was a yeah. religious professor of Hebrew, Oxford University in England. And um, so I contacted him, and we, you know, struck up a conversation, ended up applying, and, and went to study there. So I went wow. to, yep, so I did a master's at Oxford, and... From then on, um, you know, I was able to to get some funding to go and continue my education for a yeah. DPhil in Durham University, yes. which is the the northeast of England. Um, so carried on with my my DPhil there, and um, everything was going wonderfully well. Uh, another great supervisor. Um, you know, there were some little bumps in the road, but everything yeah. was going well. But then. Certain things just kind of began to fall apart, particularly on the financial, you know, sure. aspect. Oh, yeah. and we were That's really hard to sustain. Fund. It's yeah. hard to sustain. You know, thoughts we thought we had some funding internally from the university, and and it ended up not materializing. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that time, we found out we were pregnant with our, our second child. Um, <laughs> another thing in the mixer. That's right. You know, like so another. <laughs> I mean, that, that was tough because yeah. Durham. I mean, both Oxford and Durham, but I think especially Durham, they have like a really rich theological department. Mm. And so even though, you know, I, I, I love Old Testament studies and yeah. um, ancient Near Eastern studies, it was a real blessing. I mean, even my college, as at St. John's College, I was there. Um, you know, they're, they're training men for ministry, yeah. you know, in different uh, Christian traditions. And they just have a, a really broad um, yet de dedicated group wow. at that university. It's one of the best religion, you know, theology departments in the world. Hmm. And, um, they're just doing a lot of really neat things. So it was a little tough, you know, I because bet. it felt really, it was a blessing to be the plugged in and, and to find from, from lots of different traditions. And so not mm. always agreement, but still, you know, like you could see a similar heart, um, mm -hmm. you know, amongst the majority of folk who, who wanted to know the Lord, who wanted to know how he'd been revealed in Christ, mm -hmm. you know, and wanted to pursue those things together. So it was a really nice atmosphere. But that being said, um, it wasn't the Lord's will, and, mm -hmm. and um, in the end, I ended up transferring to Johns Hopkins University yep. to, to finish that Ph.D. Uh, here in Baltimore, Maryland, and that's what brought us here. Um, and that's also been 
It's a wonderful department, Near Eastern Studies department. Um, a lot of great people working on a lot of great yeah. things. Um, clearly, it's not a, an evangelical department. It's a sure. secular institution, Tier 1 Research University. Um, so there's great scholarship that's that's going on. Yeah. But I was also blessed, you know, right when I um, I came here, um, you know, I needed some some work to supplement mm-hmm. my, my stipend, you know, yeah. my student, student stipend. And um, and God provided that as well. So mm-hmm. we started at Valley Presbyterian Church. Oh yeah, you know, as assistant to the pastor there to to Dr. Fowler White, um, and he he affirmed you know my calling and my trajectory to continue in in studies. And I really at that point I I did think that the Lord was calling me to to carry on in academia and to potentially be a part of of secular departments. Yeah. Um, you know, and to 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 bring that. Um, you know that that Christian understanding of mm-hmm. it, both in in thought and in deed, um, into those secular to potentially to be a, to help and encouragement to other Christian students who would come through um, in these secular universities, um, and so that was. But I don't know if the Lord has that in mind. I think for now, at the very least, He revealed that um, you know during that time as I was working at Valley, that I really felt called to pastoral ministry um, hmm. to. To, to preach and teach the gospel within the church, to disciple, and then ultimately to, to evangelize. Um, so he just continued to affirm that um, as, as I was at Valley wow. under Fowler, even, even while also you know, promoting still like scholarship and mm-hmm. academia, like, like doing those things, which like we talked about, yeah. which, is, which is important for the church, right? Oh, um, absolutely. You know, and so, um, so I was there for a few years, and then in 2019, mm-hmm. um, my my kids were already attending Redeemer Classical yep. Christian mm-hmm. School, yep. um, and we uh, the the pastor who was there at Redeemer Presbyterian Church, desirous to retire, and we had been around that community for a few years at that point, and and God was very gracious, and they they approached me and said, you know, would you like to take this call? Yeah, and you know, I laid out this constraints. Here's my family. Yep. Uh, you know, yep. here's my here's my, my studies. educational you know, plan. Like, that's right. You know, all these things, and and the the church was just very um, very generous, and you know they. You know, they had come to a point, too, where, you know, what, what are we going to do with this lamp stand? You know, the, mm-hmm. the pastor before had ministered for, for many decades and, um, you know, had this ministry of the school. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what, and, and they felt that the Lord was, was calling a new generation, you know, and, um, and he's been faithful since. So I took that call in 2019, been there, and, um, and, and it's been faithful. God has been, been good to, to grow wow. our congregation, and that's right, and to, to continue to confess him faithfully and administer the means of grace. So... Justin, this may be, and Nathan, you would agree, one of our more interesting stories. Yeah, my absolutely. story uh, seems very dull now. Uh, so <laughs> let's let's never return to my story ever again. I'm gonna steal Justin's <laughs> and make it my own. Just, just don't tell anybody. That's some fancy editing here, right. and, and it's yours, right? I'll go back into the obscurity. You know, like it, the only thing that won't work, dude, is I know you're 38. And if we go video, nobody will ever buy that. So let, let's, I'll plan B that one. Well, you know, I mean, today's technology, we can, you know, we can, we can digitally, you know, make you younger. Yes. I mean. Can you de-age me, dude? And can you use the thin filter? Because remember the camera adds 75 pounds. Um, I said that, remember years ago, Sean Nolan, who was here yeah. at a congregational meeting, Justin, when we moved into the building we are now in where we're doing this podcast from our old smaller building. Uh, we, uh, we knew it would be kind of a culture shock. They're so different. You know, one was a quaint, almost little new England chapel, Mm -hmm. right. And moving into a warehouse space. So we knew to let our folks have a, to ease the transition. So we recorded a video where the guy filming, I'm walking around kind of pointing out, Oh, this is where we'll meet. And this is a great opportunity for this. And I keep looking at myself, oh, my goodness, that was not a good season then. And that season's just gone on. Uh, <laughs> so I, I kind of say to everybody at this meeting, it's very casual, I say, guys, just remember the camera adds about 75 pounds. Oh, and Sean Nolan is stealing the office line goes, yeah, just just how many cameras were on you? <laughs> <laughs> jab was so beautifully placed and timed i just i just took it i said man that was gold i have nothing no retort no comeback just let's accept it but touche uh, my friend yes. touche yes well i'd say we've got a pretty good groundwork nathan to, yeah to, to talk about the things that we've been building yeah. up to with the creeds, et cetera. Yeah, and and I'm I'm going to go ahead and just start us off. I'm going to read the Apostles' Creed, and yeah. I know we'll talk about 
um, you know, primarily the Athanasian Creed. You know, we'll, we'll probably work a little bit of the Nicene Creed in there as well. But the goal is um, everything that we've been doing is leading up to this because we've been talking about the idea of what is what is essential to to be a follower of Christ. Yeah. And, you know, we, we always went back to the thief on the cross that if you were to ask the thief in that moment, what is his theological base? What is his theological knowledge? It's, it's really going to boil down to, I deserve to be here. This guy doesn't, and this guy can save me. Um, very limited. Very theology. limited. Yeah. And whereas if, you know, f- for some miraculous reason, that man were to, you know, be raised with Christ on this earth and he were to live for another 50, 60, 100 years, what would his knowledge then be? Mm-hmm. And so we're here to have Justin talk to us about the, what, you know, what we call the creeds. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I'm going to read the Apostles' Creeds. And these are what I think all three of us would agree. These are what the, the early church fathers have boiled down to the essentials of what we need to know. And, um, you know, uh, Greg here at, at CFC, we do baptism by immersion. Being with the PCA, you do baptism uh, through sprinkling in infants. And so those are um, distinctives and important in the fact that we do baptism, but the mode um, is less so. Um, and and that's what we're going to talk about, the essentials of this is what we do. Yes, the creeds talk about baptism, and it's important for baptism. But how do we do that? We can disagree and argue on that and still call one another brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me go ahead and read this, and we'll dive right in. Before you do, Nathan, yes, I may have done poor prep. I'll just say this very quickly. I, <laughs> so what's I, what's new? Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I misunderstood what you were discussing. I, I've got notes here about uh, the actor Carl Weathers <laughs> and <laughs> Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> Because you said we were going to talk about at least two creeds, that, so I'm. That's okay, Greg. I okay. anticipated that from I, you, and I've got you covered. Good. Just just look at your phone. I've I'm going to look I'm at my sending phone you some stuff and adapt. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to do a quick Wikipedia page so I sound intelligent. That, Go ahead. So that means that you don't have to take your shirt off. Yeah, you have your boxing gloves. So, so we're we're clear on that. Why you're standing here? You're sitting here without your shirt. Now you can put yeah. it back on. Did, did you notice our audience can see the pleading in Justin's eyes? <laughs> <Nye's laughs> like, <laughs> please, <laughs> this means. That's right. <laughs> The, the wonder. Right, right. I got you, Nathan. Oh, Apostles' Creed. I'm ready. Right, I'm locked yeah. in, dude. Now, now we've got to shift that image yeah. back to the <laughs> Apostles' Creed. It's not 75 pounds. That's right. anyway, it's not, it's, that was very generous of you. Oh, uh, my goodness. Just to let the audience know, Greg would be considered a heavyweight. Yes, exactly. <laughs> a, uh, Drago. Yeah. He's the Drago. That's right. yeah. <laughs> I'm actually one of the huge bags of stones. <laughs> that one of them would, would would pick up, yeah, and I mean really big boulder stones in a big torn up burlap sack. So yeah, yeah, we're good. All right, all right. <laughs> um, so the Apostles' Creed: I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Can I just say that I cannot read that without thinking about the Rich Mullen song Creed? <laughs> Have you heard that before, Justin? I'm not sure. We're dating that's ourselves, Nathan. I know. I mean, that's probably mid '90s. That's true. I forgot. Justin is the uh, the young man on campus yeah. right now. So <laughs> I thought of that song uh, too when we were in prep for this. It's a it's a, it's a beautiful song, and I, yeah. I remember the refrain is. Uh, I did not make, make it. it. No, it is making yeah. me. It's the very the truth, truth of, of God. God. Not the invention of any man. Amen. It's, yeah. it's a good song. Yeah, which, you know, not, not too many pop Christian songs about the Apostles' Creed. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it really stood out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we're. I think we can just take this kind of, um, you know, 
line by line, stanza by stanza, I think we'll, we'll land a little more um, on some of these than others. You know, I think some of these will kind of move a little more quickly through. But, but again, we're talking about the essentials of the faith. And so, Justin, let's go ahead and take this, this first um, part. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And, and just talk to us about um, the importance of this statement. Yeah, I mean, I think they, they start out with just this confession that the revealed God of, of Scripture is the Lord of creation. Um, and it's, it's a natural place to begin, right? Because one thing Scripture is going to, to demonstrate is that God has revealed himself and, and worked through the Word, both in creation and redemption. So this is a place that we begin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, right? All things exist and are completely dependent mm-hmm. upon this God. And, and that, like, that sets the tone of the creed. It's this idea of dependence, yes. right, mm-hmm. upon God, both for creation and ultimately as he's revealed in Christ. And we know he created through the word, but ultimately in Christ, mm-hmm. dependent upon him for redemption. So, Yes. Now, I look at this and I notice that um, the, the attention given to, to God the Father and God the Holy Spirit is actually very small in comparison to Christ. Can you speak on that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, it's it's funny. We, we were actually kind of talking a little bit about this at the beginning of the cast, um, how these things, how, how these creeds actually came into being. And with the Apostles' Creed, we, we don't exactly know its origin, um, but presumably based on some of the testimony that we have from the early church fathers and then in the little snippets that, that come down to us in history through them, is that it was probably used for, for catechizing mm-hmm. and in baptism. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like in, <clears throat> when, when new converts were coming into the church and they were teaching them and instructing them, they, they wanted these converts to understand, understand not only the essentials, right, but the boundaries mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of their religion. So when yeah. you say, I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you can imagine coming out of a pagan context yeah. um, with lots of different worldviews and beliefs about eternality, like who is God? Is it one mm-hmm. God? Is it multiple gods? Is this God good? Is one God good, one God bad? Mm-hmm. Like all these different, um, you know, varying and compete, competing beliefs. You know, this first expression says there is one God mm-hmm. and he is mighty and he has created heaven and earth. He alone, right? So mm-hmm. it isn't as if uh, a separate God came yes. and created mm-hmm. the, the terrestrial sphere, which is inherently evil. Or mm-hmm. Things like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, so they're they're making these basic confessions, and and so one of the things that these converts needed to understand is who Christ is, mm-hmm. um, and the problem, particularly with the Apostles' Creed, if if we understand it a, a little bit better, is um, is understanding who Jesus is mm-hmm. in his humanity. Yes. right. So yeah. there wasn't a problem that uh, Jesus was God. Right. You know, earlier in the Apostolic Age, it was more along the lines of, of Jesus as man. Yeah. Yeah. And so the Apostles' Creed seems to kind of have some of those concerns at the forefront mm-hmm. um, because as they're catechizing these new believers, they want to make it clear that Jesus is all God, but he mm-hmm. is also all man. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't that just that he seemed to be a man, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. He just needed to take on the veil of flesh, but instead... He fully and authentically mm-hmm. had true human nature mm-hmm. and lived the life of a human being in its fullness. And that included birth, mm-hmm. suffering, yes. death, and mm-hmm. full bodily resurrection. Mm-hmm. Um, and these things, they, they wouldn't be immediately clear to yeah. folk. Yeah. Um, and so the creed is an attempt, at least as, I mean, we think maybe near the end of the fourth century, mm-hmm. we have a, a maybe a fuller expression. There are some church fathers that reference it in, in more of its fuller expression, but it's not until centuries later where it really comes into the form that we have it, yeah. mm-hmm. um, particularly in the Western church. It's never been accepted by the Eastern church. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we see there that um, this is why they, they speak most about Christ mm-hmm. and his humanity and his vicarious atonement, suffering, death, and resurrection as a human being. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's more the nature of God himself would have been more understood, and so you don't need to focus as much. But the confusion of, well, what is this God-man? That's something yeah. new to us. Yeah. That's what That's they're right. really going yeah. for. Yeah. How, how can this God be man? Um, and and would you say, Justin, the, and we might not have time, so I just wanted to at least touch on them. Uh, uh, additional creeds, Nicene, obviously. It's, it's, it, it, it pairs, for lack of a better word, very nicely with the Apostles' Creed, but there's more detail, correct? There Particularly is. concerning Jesus, 
uh, relationship with the father, Trinitarian building block, so to speak, uh, and Athanasian uh, as well. So it, it's, I've always sort of understood the creeds, right? Like the burning issues of the day. Mm-hmm. And I love how you tie it to new converts. Mm-hmm. What do they know? And the boundary point you made that it's, you, it's uh, sort of like the uh, there was a, a diet book, right? It's a weird uh, analogy to make that's what this, not that. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes you need to say the, that, not that to be clear. There's a line of demarcation and coming out of, you're right, these varied pagan backgrounds. Mm. Uh, it's so much, I don't know if I had a question. I had one, then I said three other things. So pick <laughs> any thread there, Justin. I think, like, yeah, out. let me start at the beginning um, because I think you were mentioning the Nicene Creed. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, when we go to the Nicene Creed, um, what we see is there's a lot more emphasis in the second part on the divinity of Christ. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's coming out of, you know, in the fourth century uh, and the, the decades preceding it. We see there's Christological controversy. Like, yeah. like how how is it then that this man can be God? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So, like, what, what does it mean that Jesus is God? And we know, obviously, that the Arian heresy... You know, some type of subordinationism where the son is is God, but less than the father. Yeah. Um, you know, like they're 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 trying to wrestle with the fact how we can have this hypostatic union. You know, this one person mm-hmm. of Jesus Christ be fully God and fully man without creating some type of third thing. Yeah. Um, and so the the Nicene Creed comes out of those Christological controversies. You might remember Arius is is qu- like the famous phrase that is associated with him is that there was a time Son was not. when he was not, right. right? You know, and then, you know, there's riots happening in yeah. the streets where people are like, it's like it's the Jets and the Sharks. You yeah. Know? Like there was a time when he was not. No, there was a time there was not a time when he was not. You yeah. know, and, and that's it's it's not quite as creative as Broadway yeah. maybe. But, but still, you know, like I Although mean, I think we have an idea now. Yeah, right? that's right. Now you know, everything yeah. you know re- recycles. Um all that to say is, so that was the, the Christological controversies in the 4th century. Those had come to the fore. And so the Nicene Creed spends more time discussing the divinity and de- deity of Jesus mm. in order to explain that, no, no, the Son is fully God, mm, yes. right? Equal, like, in mm. essence, yep. in eternality, mm-hmm. um, you know, and the other various characteristics it lays out, light of light, you know, yeah. man of God, very God, yeah. very God. Yes. So, um, so they want to they want to make sure that that's again within the boundaries of the Christian faith. Yeah. You can't think something differently yeah. about the person of Jesus Christ, the Son, yes. and you know you you can't think something differently about him and still hold to the historic Christian confession as it is um, given in Scripture. Yes, yeah. Yeah. very good, mm-hmm. very good. So as so I I think this highlights even even what we would consider with these essentials, these creeds, right? Um, and we, we talk about this in our class. Justin and I uh, teach theology. Uh, you teach to our current um, eighth and ninth graders. I teach to ninth and tenth. Um, sorry, we're, we're, we're switching Bible That's curriculums right, around, so I'm trying That's to right. remember Change which is which. Uh, but yeah, the ninth and tenth, and then I teach. This is the final year that we're teaching systematic theology to our eleventh graders, and that will go to apologetics. But one of the things that I know we both emphasize is that these documents are helpful, but they're not Scripture. They help us to understand Scripture, but in and of themselves, they are still incomplete, and we need Scripture in order to to help us understand them in their fullness. Um, And so, again, when we look at something like the Apostles' Creed, the Apostles' Creed is going to focus on Christ and his humanity, where the Nicene Creed will focus on Christ and his divinity. Um, And I think that just shows us that um, even in these documents that we hold to as essential without scripture, there's something missing. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's it's important to put creeds and confessions in their rightful order of priority Mm -hmm. and authority, right? I mean, scripture is our infallible rule Mm -hmm. for faith and practice. Um, It won't lead us astray, it won't Mm -hmm. lead us into error. Um, So what place do creeds and confessions have? Well, they are reliable guides Mm -hmm. to faith and practice. Uh, The creeds in their succinctness, right, they form the boundaries of our faith. And I think also we can go further, and Calvin will say this. I mean, this might be a topic we'll touch on a little bit later, but this gives us great assurance as well when we we confess these creeds, Mm -hmm. that as we confess and believe in these truths, then we are assured 
of salvation and eternal life in Christ. Yeah. Um, and this is because God's work of redemption is not based on subjective feeling or emotion. Yeah. The yeah. creeds show us and they affirm for us that it's objectively based on what God has done in Christ. Yeah. Right? It's the objective work of redemption that is the foundation of our salvation, right? So mm-hmm. we confess these things, um, mm-hmm. and as we do so, we we desire to live and to die within this confession because mm-hmm. it means for us, for those who are Christians in Christ, it means for us eternal life. Yeah. So the confessions in particular, they they sus. I mean, they 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 exp- expand a little bit on on the the details yeah. of our faith and practice as reliable guides mm-hmm. but always yeah. under the authority of scripture and and this is what what our 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 fathers in the faith would say is that this is not just what what we think right nobody who wrote one or, or participated in the writing of the creeds or the confession will say well this is just what we believe yes. right you know they're saying this is what scripture says I yeah. love that. like this is what scripture says right and and if you say otherwise yeah. you're not talking against our voice or our opinion yeah. right you're talking against scripture yeah. you know so I, I love that you made that point Justin this ties into what we've when we've rebooted this is what we're really trying to say there is a core belief system, Mm -hmm. um, uh, confessional statements, they're propositional. Um, We talked a few weeks ago about the uh, alleged uh, St. Francis of Sissy quote, you know, uh, preach the gospel if necessary, use words, and said, while it it looks nice on a on a uh, wall on a, in the on, house, on a wall or, yeah. in the home, next to a Thomas Kincaid picture or something. It, <laughs> it's a bit because words, of course, are necessary. Mm. Right? Nobody's ever um, understood what Christ accomplished for them on the cross by sitting by a babbling brook. What do we say through charades? <laughs> right. Exactly. Faith right. comes through hearing, and hearing through the Word of God. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I think this is so good. And one of our our other concerns is in the last few years. Uh, it's interesting that you took your pastorate uh, and accepted that call 2019, and we were talking about that at breakfast, how I said, boy, you got in just uh, just under the gun, yeah. didn't you, with COVID hitting you less than a year later. And, of course, as all churches have kind of had to find their way through that, that labyrinth uh, these last few years, we've noticed a, a preoccupation among many Christians and Christian movements to find definition in what we would call ancillary matters mm-hmm. that are often politics oriented your opinion on the 2020 election mm-hmm. your opinion on january 6 mm-hmm. your thoughts and convictions on vaccines that in a sense i see this as well wow, there's other nobody ever says this but almost unspoken creedal formulations happening that can rival and you know to be able to point to something like this the creed and say to somebody hey Listen, you and I might see, uh, you know, the, the last three years completely differently. Let's walk through this creed together. Mm-hmm. This is our common brotherhood, mm-hmm. right? And just um, that, that, that's a thought I just yeah. had now, that it's almost like these other um, issues, litmus topics, tests yeah. become creeds in themselves, and mm-hmm. people don't even realize it. Um, where this could be taken for, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah God, yeah, Jesus, well, yeah, that's great, that's great. Uh, let's talk about vaccines, because we as Christians know X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Let's talk about this, because we as Christians know X, Y, and Z. So uh, to pivot from that, Justin, when you think of a person, say there's just a person lived a very, uh, you know, what I would call typical American, maybe, maybe secular lifestyle, right? Their understanding of God was formed through... TV, songs, pop culture, never had a church background. Um, person, you know, you start meeting them for coffee. They got a little interest. They had a life experience that got them interested in spiritual things, etc. And say in the course of that, that conversation, they profess faith. Um, I'm gonna, would you use the creed potentially as, as a starting point for them? If, if there's something else, that's fine too. I'm just curious, as you think of it pastorally, what you would do. Yeah, I mean, I might not, um, you know, ex- express it like this is the Apostles' Creed. Right. Let's go through right. this point by right. point, yeah. you know. But, but I think the heart of what the Creed is expressing is: it's does this individual mm-hmm. like do they acknowledge? that God in heaven is the Lord of creation and redemption yes. that has accomplished these things through the word, through Jesus. Yeah. 
And the only means by which we can come to him is as humble sinners in need of his atonement on our behalf. Right. Yeah. Um, and this is what and this is what the, the, the creed is doing. You know, it's ultimately laying out, you know, this creation and redemption in succinct form, right? You know, yeah. and and so I, I I don't I mean, I think there would be a place potentially, you yeah. know, to, to use it and to walk through it with them. Yeah. But um my, my guess based on what you said in your love of scripture, which is obviously very clear and, and we all share it. Um, it's almost like the guy. Yeah, you're probably going to go to places in Scripture that that the creed has already articulated. Oh, sure. Right. Sure, so right. obviously, what are we thinking? Okay, who is God? Who is Jesus? What has Jesus done, mm. and why has He done it? What are the the benefits, the concomitant blessings that come into our lives as a result? Um, I will ask you this. Nathan and I had um, a conversation a while back, back in the fall. There were some folks in the church at that time who um, who got really locked in on the um, six day, twenty four hour literal days of creation. Um, I was able to finally, in conversations, tell them we ourselves at CFC. I surveyed our elder team. You know, sat with the the, the six of us, and uh, I was encouraged. There were divergent views on that. We've got a guy going to seminary at Westminster. He's a uh, 24-hour, six-day guy, wonderful brother, um, you know, uh, really, really um, knowledgeable. And we've got guys that a mm, little more agnostic on that question. They might lean old earth, etc. I'm just curious. It's interesting that the creed doesn't address that yeah. on the matter of creation. No, that's right, and and neither do our historic reform confessions. Yes, um, and this and this says something, right? I you kind of mentioned it earlier, Greg, when you're talking about vaccines, yeah. position on politics. We there is this inappropriate desire, at times in the in the Christian life, particularly in mainstream evangelicalism, for religious certainty on on things, mm-hmm. right? We we want to be certain sure. on on certain things that Scripture doesn't speak to. Yeah. Right? So we want to extend its voice beyond those fundamental mm-hmm. components of revelation, yeah. um, and and this is I think this happens with the the creation account. Um, you know, de- depending on what position you take, uh, it, I think one thing that we can acknowledge is neither the creeds or historic confessions come down with exactly this six day, mm-hmm. 24 hour view, right. Mm-hmm. right? They don't because they understand that this goes beyond scripture's revelation, its purpose right. to reveal. Um, and we might say, well, I, I favor one position mm-hmm. over another. And I'll, I'll say I favor the six day, 24 hour position sure. mm-hmm. over the others. Uh, nonetheless, for me to demand that as a measure of your orthodoxy yeah. goes beyond mm-hmm what scripture requires. It requires a level of religious certainty that scripture doesn't require, and therefore to make it a measure of our faith goes beyond what scripture says. And Mm -hmm. that's, and that's dangerous. Like even in, even in the Westminster confession, you, you probably come across this Nathan, um, as you, you teach the 11th graders, like there have been, there were, there are places that the historic reformed Presbyterian church, particularly in the United States said, I wonder if the, the divines went beyond what scripture is really saying uh, here mm-hmm. about this particular topic. The most famous example is the topic of the Antichrist. Okay. Um, yeah. It's identifying yeah. the Pope as the Antichrist. Yeah, right, right. Um, and therefore, you know, they like in American Presbyterianism, you know, they said, well, you, you don't have to subscribe to that clause in order to be completely in line to take essentially take no mm-hmm. um, variation from the confession because we believe that scripture just it doesn't identify that individual yeah. as the Antichrist. And, yeah. and but we do that in all different parts of, of our lives, right? We want to make these things peripheral yes. at Aophora, right? On the outside, you know, unnecessary peripheral to scripture. Right. We want to make these things things, distinguishing characteristics and measures of our, of our biblical faithfulness. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and, and we ask too much in yeah. that point, right? We have to live in this tension, yeah, that's um, you know, this tension example. of the spirit, yeah. right? We, we've got to, yeah. um, and trust that if the spirit was within us, you know, and we're, we'll bear the proper fruit of the spirit. Yeah. Um, and that, and that doesn't necessarily touch on some of these um, these civil issues yeah, that we might yeah. have. Well, you touched on something earlier, Justin, that I think is so good. You said, live and die by these creeds. Yeah, like if somebody too. were to hold a gun to my head 
the things that I would stick to and I would be willing to lose my life for, that, that's laid out here. The creation account, the six literal days or, or, or older. Don't forget your millennial position. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's important. <laughs> Iron that out right now. <laughs> if somebody were to hold a gun to my head and tell me that I need to switch my view on that, I would have very little difficulty doing that because yeah. to me, that's not worth losing my life over. Uh, like that's just one of those issues that to me, um, I would be better served uh, living my life and, and being able to focus on the essentials where if somebody says you need to deny that um, Christ is the only son of God, you need to deny that he was born of a virgin you need to deny that, you know, he suffered. He, those are things that I, I can't do that. I'm willing, and, and the, the early church fathers, you know, the, the apostles were willing to go to the grave for these matters. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and those are the matters that you see Paul willing to go to the mat for, right? I mean, when, you know, the, the, the group that he gets upset with the most is the Galatian church because they've gotten the gospel wrong. They've gotten the very message of Christ wrong. Yeah. And that's really where you see him get his ire up. But everything else, you know, you go you go to the book in um, you know first first Corinthians, right, where you've got a whole lot of stuff going on. But he's he's at least coming in and encouraging them and commending them in their faith. Those first nine you verses, know? dude, we've talked about that before. Blow my mind every time I think about them because he even commends them in the arena of spiritual gifts, mm-hmm. which is shocking. But just by saying they've been given these gifts, Mm -hmm. evidence of God's grace to them. And I'm thinking he's going to address three full chapters uh, or to uh, address them in three full chapters where he takes them to task as he should, the abuse, the distortion, the practice of how those gifts played out in Corinth. But he commends, but you're right. Galatians, which you would almost say pretty orthodox group. We don't have any of this. Mm, They're wrong about the gospel. Right. So I'm going to the mat. I did, Nathan, I know we're wrapping up. You gave us a signal. Yeah. And I know that, as you now know, Justin, the outline we sent you, ooh, the conversation is probably going differently. Welcome to these go to yeah, I think that's probably my fault. <laughs> no, not, not at all. No, no, no. no. This is, we love we it. Love this, it. This yeah. is, we always kind of love, oh, then let's see what we plan. Let's see what comes out. Yeah. Usually like what comes out better. Um, I do have to ask you, because I'm yes. sure some of yep. our listeners, yep. um, he descended into hell. Mm. Of of the all the single statements in the creed, that's always the one that is the head scratcher, of course. And yeah. I know there's been a lot of debate discussion. Can you give us a uh, brief insight <laughs> into the different views? I know on what, what Justin's saying. Is. Yeah. How do I do that in right, a couple right. of minutes? You, you but gave me the thirty second. We, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Here's going a little longer than thirty. We, we won't ask you to tell us your view on that, I but we'll I'm ask done. you sure, to uh, sure. yeah. you know tell us what are the views on that. Sure. Yeah. Like uh, maybe if I just kept it to three. Yeah. Sure. Three. Yeah. Okay. So like the first most basic one is probably just to say that he that he died. Like that yeah. Jesus yeah. was really dead between the crucifixion and the resurrection. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's number one. Number two, um, and this is one that has had a lot of traction in, mm-hmm. in church history, um, is that it's Jesus made some post-death appearance uh-huh. mm-hmm. to those who had passed before him. Mm-hmm. Who exactly that, that group of people mm-hmm. is, a lot of debate surrounding that. But when they say he descended into hell, they're, they're referring to some type of post-death, pre-resurrection, mm-hmm. this interim time in which Jesus makes an appearance to those who have died mm-hmm. prior to him. And like I said, there's there's a lot of debate about who that group of people would potentially be. Sure. The third view, uh, and this is like the historic reformed um, you know, review, ref, uh, view in the church, um, is that that is a way to express that Jesus experienced yeah. the full wrath of mm. God as the propitiation, the yeah. satisfaction of the wrath of God yeah. for our sins. Yeah. Right? That, is, that expression is meant to say there was not one ounce that was spared yeah. because he is the son yeah. upon that cross, but he made cre- complete and full atonement yeah. Yeah in his propitiation and expiation for sins on that cross. And that is the punishment yeah. of hell, yeah. right? I mean, if, yeah. if, So if, literally, he was punished by going to hell and suffering in hell. Yes, and if you think, I mean, that is what, he, he's a substitute for us mm-hmm. who are all sinners condemned under the judgment of God to right. hell. And he experiences that judgment, that full yeah. judgment. And if you, you think about this, he's, how, how long is he, on, he, is he on that cross? Six yeah. hours, right? Yeah, yeah. Can, can you imagine? Like, we we can never imagine yeah. Yeah. the no. agony no. of our Savior. I mean, innumerable sinners yeah. 
for whom he is dying, yeah. that, that the Father has given to him yeah. to atone for. Yeah. Like if, if we were on that cross, we would never get off of it. Right. Right. Yeah. No amount of time would be enough to yeah. satisfy the wrath of God right. for our sin. Jesus Christ yeah. bears that judgment for all of the role of heaven in six hours yeah. to its fullest. Wow. Yeah. You, 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 yeah. It's, 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 it's incomprehensible yeah. because like you said, it's, it's an eternity mm. and not just for one person. And that's what we need to realize. It's, it's, it, it's the punishment for every single person who will profess faith in Christ mm. past, present and future. Yeah. And, and, you know, and so all of that magnitude and combined eternity worth of punishment for every single one of those, like you said, in six hours. Mm. Um, and it's amazing. Yeah. And you tie that, of course, that, I mean, what's the cry of dereliction, right? The, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? Yeah. I heard R.C. Sproul on this years ago, uh, since you mentioned Sproul, who was combating the notion that, um, well, this is Jesus. Uh, essentially being Shakespearean, hmm. right? He's quoting, and I remember Sproul, he just said it, he, he, got, he, he, was, he paused and he says, I don't believe in that moment he was in a poetic mood. No. Yeah. You know, I think he was giving voice yeah. mm. to the heart of his mission mm. and what he would do and to tie that in in the Garden of Gethsemane and to see him contemplating that cup which is, you know, a, a, a usual symbol for the wrath of God, Jeremiah mm-hmm. 25 and uh, other places. Uh, it's it just, yeah, you can't take it in, mm-hmm. which is why my daughter, interestingly enough, had to do when she was at Washington and Lee, a paper on Socrates. And one of her professors proposed this idea that actually John Stott addressed. So I always wondered if there was a connection. You know, you could ask the question, was Socrates braver than Jesus? Because the story goes, he took the hemlock without hesitation. So Jesus hesitates in the garden, one could argue, right? Mm-hmm. He's, he's praying, he's asking about the possibility, mm-hmm. we see him in his full humanness. And then, just to consider, if you think what Socrates was, was yeah. taking, well, oh yeah, yeah, I'm impressed. Uh, if that's, you know, what the noble willingness to die for right. the truth as he saw it, to compare those two yeah. uh, moments, yeah. It's it's beyond compare. Well, when you think about um, any human who will ever face the wrath and punishment of God, they're only going to face it for themselves. Only right. For themselves. You know, I mean, that's and that's it. So even even the the compounding factor of what Christ does, yeah. and and every person whom who who he takes the wrath and the punishment for, um, you know. It really, you know, you think about the mercy and grace of God. You know, God is not going to punish someone beyond their sins, mm-hmm. but his own son, he punishes for the sins of others. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and so, you know, even in God's punishment, there's still the mercy that he's not going to punish that person beyond what they deserve. Yeah. yeah. You know, and yeah, so. well said. Can I say, Nathan, maybe in closing, I, I love when you were reading the creed, I saw you, Justin, looking on your phone at yours. I was looking on my phone at mine. And you, I had you were thought, looking at the football stats, Greg. Let's be real. Well, <laughs> I may have been looking at the Rotten Tomatoes uh, reviews of Poker Face, the new brilliant uh, whodunit by Ryan Johnson. But that's a whole other story. But I also, at one point, I think I had the creed on there somewhere. Um, no, I, I, and I'm thinking, I love this, right? Because yeah. here's a, a fellow pastor. Yeah. Uh, with me in this room today. And of course, uh, we could sit down as I did with my friend Mark Fodale years ago, who's yep. a PCA uh, brother in uh, in Pennsylvania, who I went to seminary with. And we talked baptism. Remember, we yeah. had really, good, yeah. I think, discussion, debate. And those things are worth it. I think yeah. those things matter. Nobody's saying they don't matter. Nobody's mm-hmm. saying we can't have some passion and scholarship mm-hmm. and all those things. But at the end of the day, I know Justin's looking at this. His heart is rising to meet the words in the, yes, this is my faith. I'm doing it. You're doing it. And it's just a beautiful picture of unity. Yeah, you know that we believe yeah. in these things, distinct Christian truths. Yeah, that are, are this, not that. And we talked last week. Uh, I, I there was another blogger years ago. Somebody was saying, "Well, yeah, you know, I mean, this whole notion of you know Jesus being um, physically resurrected. I'm not sure that's so important." And remember, I think he expected her to be on her side. Yeah. Well, what you're talking about, I understand. She was very polite about it. Is something that's distinctively non-Christian, yeah. un-Christian. 
right? Like, mm. I love that, that there is a, a line right. of demarcation. No, no, this is the historic. There's right. no, I mean, you can call it what you want, right? but it isn't. There is no getting around uh, it. Yeah. You cannot get around these truths. This is essential Christianity, and I think you've really elucidated that for us, Justin. Yeah. Uh, and I know we just scratched the surface, so we'll, we'll have to have it. This, I enjoyed. That. Yeah, this was great. Thank yeah. you we so much for joining us. I, the verdict wasn't in because I knew for some reason you like Nathan, and I I like Nathan. <laughs> he as, always questions someone who likes. I, me. I have my doubts, you know. Uh, so I'm right. thinking I love Nathan because you know I you, I should extend mercy to one or two people in my life. <laughs> Good practice. But I'm thinking this guy likes you, Nathan. And, uh, I thought it was the other way around. Yeah. I thought it was Nathan extending it to me. You know, it's, uh, uh, but you. Justin, I just love the way you think, the way you've expressed and. And the, uh, the there's a lot of deep rivers there in your heart, and um, I look forward to more. Yeah, that's yeah. great. It's been a real blessing. Thank you, gentlemen. Oh, thank for you for having me on. You know, welcome. It was a privilege, gentlemen. Until the next time, we just rock the Casbah. 1982, baby. <laughs> I wasn't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again for listening to these. Go to eleven, an unchurchy conversation about everyday faith. Once again, please make sure you like, subscribe, and review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you ever find yourself in the Forest Hill, Maryland area, please feel free to stop by at 135 Industry Lane, and you can get all of our service times and information at ChristFC.org. These go to 11.